that the answer and the solution for us is to break our allegiance with white power and join in solidarity with the struggle of African people everywhere and to win other white people to the stand of reparations to African people and to turn back over the stolen resources. So we are calling this meeting today in response to this whole discussion and the march last weekend, the discussion about women that has come up under um, in the context of the election of Trump and, uh, you know, and the response to that, which is a separate issue that we do want to talk about and even have a whole evening's, um, pardon me? It's, it's this camera. I'm just saying. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, you know, we want to be able to have a whole discussion just on that, on, on the election, on what it is that, uh, how we understand that. But today we want to talk about the question of women, and I think that this is, this is really, really important. And so we begin by saying the understanding that we have from the African People's Socialist Party, from Chairman Omali Shatawa, the understandings of African internationalism, which we are not, of course, African, but we can be and are African internationalists. We can embrace the understanding of the point of view of seeing the world from the eyes of, of African workers all around the world. We can begin to see the world in this way and understand it and um, thereby become African internationalists ourselves. And so we say that there's no honest discussion that can happen in this country about any subject that is not predicated on the reality that there are two Americas and two sets of conditions for people, including women inside this country, inside this borders, inside this land, which is stolen land, and which is, as the chairman says, a prison of nations, that there is colonialism happening inside the borders of the United States. And so we have two sets of realities. We have the oppressor nation, that's us, and we have the oppressed. And while um, this is something that takes place inside the borders of the U.S., it's like um, there is this, in a certain way, this invisible wall that's a colony, the colonies inside this country. And we know if we tell the truth and we look at the world and this country as it really is, that the conditions for white people, and which we sometimes say North American people, are completely different than those conditions faced by Africans and indigenous people. So all white people, all including white women, sit on the pedestal of the enslavement and oppression of African men, women, and children, sit on the pedestal of the genocide of the indigenous people and the oppression of colonized peoples around the world. It was the enslavement of African people and genocide and colonialism, the land theft, um, the theft of the land here in the U.S. And, and in Africa and around the world that gave birth to capitalism itself. And this assault on Africa, this enslavement of African people, this kidnapping of a whole continent of human beings, this is the basis for the wealth, the prosperity, and the power of U.S. imperialism, of Europe, and also of the rights, prosperity, education, everything that white people experience, whether we're inside the United States, whether we're in Europe, whether we're in South Africa, in Israel, or any uh, Australia, or any other place in the world. The reality of our sitting on the backs of African people colors and shapes all of our thoughts, our ideas, our aspirations, and our goals. It shapes how we see the world. Because of this pedestal, we see ourselves as the subjects of history, as if we, the conquerors, the real terrorists in this world, the colonizers and the slave masters, as if we are the real makers of history. And the real people and everyone else is traditionally the other or the objects of history, as the chairman explains. 
that we are the real people. Everybody else are the objects of history. So it is about white people that we have the first person stories, the story of Anne Frank, um, the whole question of the Jewish Holocaust, which is used to um, as, a, as a, uh, a hammer on the heads of the people around the world, when in fact, what happened to the Jews came at the end, after Europe had committed genocide in Africa and against the indigenous peoples here in many places around the world for hundreds of years as part of the European assault on the rest of the world. Um, so the discussion of the oppression that white women might face takes place in the context, in that context, in all our rights as white women have come at the expense of the suffering of African people and colonized people around the world. And that's called opportunism. Because we sit on the backs of African and other people and experience the world with ourselves in the center of it. We have always tried to control and dictate to African people, attempting to define their struggle and dismissing them altogether. I am saying that because the African People's Socialist Party represents African working class men and women speaking for themselves. So to understand the what is called feminism in this country, I want to say that there's been two waves of what is called white feminism in this country. And one, what's called the first wave of feminism, of white feminism, began for white women to have the vote. And this is, is considered to have started about 1848 inside this country, a time when um, African people were still enslaved. And in fact, that's the very year that the U.S. was attacking um, Mexico and stealing half of their land which became the Southwest. And it was also a time when the opium wars were going on, when, when Britain and the U.S. were attempting to impose opium um, onto the people of China. Many other things, this was a, a serious time of, of colonialism um, around the world. And so it is considered that white women began this struggle of feminism around 1848, and it ended with the passage of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, granting white women the right to vote in 1920. And then there was a second wave, it's called the second wave of feminism, and that began in the 1960s. So both waves of this white feminism were sparked by powerful movements of African people. The first one was inspired by of course, the African-led struggle to end the hideous system of chattel slavery. And the second, the second wave came about in the 1960s, inspired by the Black Power movement, the Black Revolution of the 1960s. And both waves of white feminism ended with white women selling themselves basically to the highest bidder of the white ruling class. And also, that many of the women who made up this movement were from the white ruling class in order to make as much money as white men and to sit at the table equally with white men as colonizers and imperialists of the oppressive nation. That's what the white feminist movement has been about all throughout its history, from 1848 all the way through to the 1960s and what we see today. So the first wave of white feminism spanned more than 70 years of history that included the chattel enslavement of African men, women, and children, the brutal period after the so-called abolition when African people were massively re-enslaved in the system called convict leasing, which was worse than slavery, which was when the states, after the abolition of, of private ownership of African people, ended and this went on for 70, 80 years itself when the states, the southern states became the slave masters and used African people to build roads, to go into the mines of Birmingham, Alabama, and here in Florida, the phosphate mines, 
working African people basically to death, and the slogan was that convict legion was worse than slavery, and that if one dies, they said, just get another. When African people in this period during, that spanned um, the 70 years when uh, white women were struggling for the vote in this country, um, African people were being lynched every single day. Their towns were being attacked and burned by white people, and African people, including African women, were being murdered in a myriad of ways. In spite of the sheer terror that African women experienced during these years, the issues of African women were never taken up by the white women's movement. For a time, the white women's movement of that period used Sojourner Truth, an African woman who had grown up enslaved and who was reportedly an amazing and charismatic speaker, um, they used her for their own games. And famously, Sojourner Truth said that she had plowed fields and done hard labor, and she said, an ain't I a woman? And the white women's movement used Sojourner Truth to draw crowds, but then basically they used her, spit her out, and threw her away. Um, they were never acknowledged the conditions of African women. That was never part of the white women's movement. White women played a major role, if not the major role, in the white terror attacks called the lynchings, which went on for, um, for 100 years in this country where African people were terrorized and, and burnt and hanged from trees. And this was not something that happened furtively in the middle of the night. This was a popular um, celebration of white people, often 10,000 people attending a lynching. And there were dances and bands playing and... Um, you know, just souvenirs, meaning that ears were cut off, hands were cut off, sexual organs were cut off, and sold to white people. This is how gory this was. This happened all over the country. Thousands of African men, women, and children were murdered this way, and it was carried out by regular white people, and white women played a key role in this, so much so that Ida B. Wells, the African woman who worked with Marcus Garvey, in the 1910s and 1920s challenged white women as being the ones that egged on the um, violence, um, egged on white men to carry out this, this brutal violence against African people. So white women would claim that African men raped them, attempted to rape them, or just looked at them. And that was enough. That was enough for them to be murdered and slaughtered. White women, it said, gathered the firewood for the fire, built the fires, and dressed up their little girls in starched pinafores and bows in their hair to pose them in front of the lifeless bodies of burnt, hanged African men. If the white men were not quick enough to be violent, white women egged them on. Here in St. Petersburg, Florida, when the African man John Evans was being attacked in, I think it was 1916, um, if he was being attacked and he was going to be lynched, a white woman stood in her car yelling, kill him, kill him, fomenting this murder. When white feminist leaders, and this was never an issue of the white feminist movement, and when white feminist leaders such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who still put forward today and in the history books as a great feminist leader that white women are supposed to look up to. Um, when she was fighting for the vote for white women, Stanton made the statement that she would not endorse the right of African men's suffrage a right to vote because she said, quote, well, she was asked straight out whether she was willing to have African men enfranchised before women, and she answered, no, I would not trust him meaning African, an African man with my rights, degraded, oppressed himself, he would be more despotic with the governing power than ever our Saxon rulers are. So this was the nature of, 
of the white feminist movement. And again, it never mentioned the agenda, the conditions of African women and oppressed women here and around the world. The second wave of feminism, which we are at the tail end of right now, was sparked by the black liberation movement, the black revolution of the 1960s. And that's why it was called the women's liberation movement, because the black movement was called the black or African liberation movement. And they used to call it women's live and all this kind of thing. They changed that now. They didn't want to have anything to, to harken back to, to those days. Um, but it happened because the black power movement, the black revolution in the 60s, was the key force inside this country that galvanized indigenous people, or galvanized Puerto Rican people and their movement, it galvanized the Mexicans and the brown berets and the black berets, and um, it galvanized the revolutionary spirit that connected with the fact that revolution was the main trend in the whole world, in China, in Vietnam, throughout Africa, throughout Asia, throughout the Middle East, and in indigenous um, in South America and North America, revolution was everywhere. It was the period of Che Guevara and Ho Chi Minh and Mao Zedong and, and, um, and so many others. And the Black Power Movement was part of that, and it was seen by people in China and revolutionaries in China and Vietnam as really key because it was inside the belly of the beast that these forces around the world were fighting ex from the exterior of the U.S. continent. So it, it was extremely important to the struggle for the whole world. And the whole articulation of the Black Power Movement in that period was powerful. And it challenged everything that, um, that white power and white people had thought, had taken for granted, and could get away with. And so white women used a lot of the kind of language and, and, and struggle and stance. They appropriated that from the Black Power Movement and used it. And um, that, but again, white women used the articulations to build a movement that was about opportunism. And in case you're not clear, opportunism means selling out the interests of the masses um, for the short-term gains of a few. And that's what we've done over and over again because we sit on this pedestal of the oppression of, of the African people. And so there was this whole thing called affirmative action. And it was supposed to be for something that African people had won off of the life and death struggle that African people underwent and all throughout the 1950s and the 1960s went up against um, hoses, you know, big hoses and tear gas and guns and people were murdered and killed during this, during this struggle. It was a matter of life and death for African people. And it won something called affirmative action, which would give the ability for African people to be able to go in and be able to admit it to a college that it usually wouldn't be, a person wouldn't be admitted to, or perhaps have an opportunity to get a job that African people wouldn't otherwise or previously be um, considered for. But according to an article in Time Magazine in 2013, it said that while, quote, people of color, individually and as groups, have been helped by affirmative action in subsequent years, data and studies suggest white women in particular. In 1995, six million women, the majority of whom were white, had jobs they wouldn't have otherwise held without affirmative action. So that white women took the affirmative action and got faces of higher pay and higher up on this pedestal to sit at the table with white men to become 
equal oppressors um, with white men, equal colonizers, equal members of the oppressor nation who can make equal amounts of money of the stolen loot that comes from the enslavement of African people and oppressed peoples around the world. So, just as in the first feminist movement, <clears throat> white women still, from the 1960s, got our rights at the expense of the African community with the goal to be equal partners in colonialism with white men. We fought to be not to end oppression, not to end imperialism, not to end a system based on, on rape and terror, um, used as a weapon of war and, and conquest against the indigenous people, against African people, and against the peoples on the planet Earth, but to be part of the military and police. So we fought to be equal pillars with white men in the U.S. military. Think people like Lindy England. Remember her? She was the chief torturer in Abu Ghraib. She was a U.S. military soldier in Iraq um, who, whose pictures were the first ones to appear and be showing, obviously, her role in torture, absolute torture and degradation of Iraqi people and Iraqi men. And we fought to be equal pillars in the police departments, like Betty Shelby, who was a cop out in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who murdered this past summer Terrence Crutcher. And this is what was fought for. Not, not the ability of all women, because there's no such thing as women in general, not the ability of African women to um, be part of the struggle of their whole nation to end the oppression of the whole people by having freedom and liberation um, and control and self-government over the lives of African people. So, <clears throat> as feminists, white women have done nothing to stop the almost daily murders of African people by the police but has left thousands of African women without their children, spouses, or fathers, or has done nothing about the fact that African women are being murdered by the police themselves, like Sandra Bland or Corin Gaines and many others. They've done nothing to end the mass incarceration of African people, including the fact that 800% increase has happened in the imprisonment of African women inside the U.S., which has the largest prison population in the entire planet. Half of the prison population of the U.S. is our African men, and another 25% are Mexican and indigenous people. So 75% of the people in U.S. concentration camps called prisons are African, Mexican, and indigenous the colonial prison system. The white women's movement has never addressed the fact that colonialism is imposed on African people here inside this country, never addressed the police state imposed on the African community, even as, as white women are, are fearful of the police state, of the Trump administration. Um, it's already been there, imposed by the Democratic Party onto the African community. It's never done anything to oppose the government imposition of deadly drugs into the African community, which has left African women as single mothers because the men have been locked up or it's taken the children away from African women and put them in this brutal colonial foster care system in which they are brutalized, sexually abused, and, and treated horribly by their white um, foster parents. Um, and that it's done nothing about the fact that 38% of African children grow up in poverty, while white families have 22 times the wealth of black families inside this country. So we want to say that U.S. colonial society is horrible. It's intolerable. It's, you know, even the oppressor nation can feel this. This is why so many white people are now becoming hopelessly addicted to drugs. They have nothing to live for as long as white people are tied to the 
system that is built at the expense of everybody else. As long as white people see our identity and our future in a system built on slavery, on genocide, on oppression of everybody else. And they see that this system is in a crisis because African people and oppressed people around the world are rising up, fighting against imperialism, and even white pundits agree that the U.S. can no longer do what it used to do with impunity. That it, it's becoming, it no longer has hegemony over the entire world. So we're saying that this is an intolerable society. It's this parasitic capitalist society that we live in. That white women, you know, it's like we unite as, and I'm saying they actually, as far as the white women's movement, have created a situation where white women unite with oppression that we experience in order that we can make more money and have a higher place on this pedestal at the expense of everybody else and be equal to men. And that, yeah, we live in a society in which white women are, and girls are sexualized and one in five white women are, are um, cutting up their faces and, and their breasts and, and you know, feel uh, the need to look a certain way that, you know, that have voluntary surgery. Um, women's bodies sell everything from cars to chainsaws. And we live in a culture of rape and violence against women but this is a culture of rape and violence that is the result of parasitic capitalism, the result of colonialism and terror against everybody else on the planet. And this rape and violence that we see coming back on us is a symptom of a system that's built on rape and violence, that is built on the enslavement of all African people, men and women, and on the genocide of all indigenous people in the theft of their land. And I want to say also that white women talk about rape, they talk about sexual violence, but nothing in this society or the stance of the women's movement does anything to change that. And the only thing that can change that is overturning of imperialism. It's built on rape and violence. The white women's movement never talks about the fact that in the Democratic Republic of Congo, U.S.-backed forces um, who have been trained and armed by the U.S. government and by the Clinton Foundation and the Clinton family, by the way, by the Democrats, have, are carrying out hideous rapes in, of, of women in the Congo and have murdered 7 million people, including women and children, in the Congo in the last 7 to 10 years. This is not on the agenda of the white women's movement. The blood diamonds, the theft of Africa's resources and the incredible poverty of African women on the continent of Africa, in the Caribbean and here, this is not on the agenda of the white women's movement. It has no interest in the conditions that African women face. So, once again, from the movement of the 60s, we also got higher incomes, rights, and education at the expense of African people, including African women. So we, as white people, and certainly we as white women, owe reparations to African people. We owe reparations to African people because everything that we have, everything that, um, every democratic, constitutional, human rights that white women have gained has been through the struggle of African people who gave their lives for that and has been at their expense. But we owe reparations to African people, just as the whole society does. There's another issue in the struggle, and that's the fact that, um, in this discussion tonight, that, that this whole women's thing has been catapulted by the election of Trump. But Trump and Clinton the Republicans and the Democrats are no different from each other. And that everything that Hillary Clinton did and Obama did have been hideous towards African women and oppressed peoples around the world. 
nobody has carried out a war strategy as deadly and as, um, as, as huge as Barack Obama did. And that's not talked about by white women or white liberals or anything else. And so we want to, and, and by the way, this whole intensification of the police violence against African people happened under Obama, and he never took a stand against that or did one thing to lift a finger. He changed that. And the fact that 800% increase of African women in prison, Obama said nothing about that. The mass imprisonment of African people going to prison for restructure out for 30 years to life for things that white people aren't even arrested for, like this whole drug addiction, which is now that white people have it in epidemic form, we're supposed to feel sorry and understand how pitiful this is. But when African people had drugs and crack cocaine imposed on them by the U.S. government, something that was proven by U.S. congressional hearings of the Iran-Contra um, situation, um, Africans go to prison for a tiny little bit of, of drugs that were imposed on them. So there's two different realities, the colonial reality and the reality of the oppressive nation. So I just want to say that, um, that, that the African People's Socialist Party is committed to the end of the oppression of African women in the context of the struggle of the liberation of all African people everywhere. And you can see this is one of their, their points in the 14-point program um, that is in every issue of the Burning Day newspaper. And this is carried out not only in theory but in practice because the majority of the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party are women and always have been. And um, that from the White Solidarity Committee, we want to see an end to the oppression of women, even if for ourselves. But we are not going to get our rights at the expense of African people. We're not fighting to gain equality with white men in a system in which our liberation means that we would have a greater ability to share with them the domination of African people and others around the world, to share in the stolen resources and the loot gained from oppressed people. The only solution to a system built on violence oppression, rape, and suffering of the majority is that it has to be overturned. And that is being led by the African Revolution, by the African People's Socialist Party, which is very, very serious about liberating Africa, getting back its land, uniting African people, tearing down the borders, and winning back the reparations, seizing back the reparations, the stolen loot that belongs to African people that built the wealth and imperialism. So if we are against the oppression of all women, then we stand in solidarity with African people to struggle for their liberation as part of their whole people. And we fight for reparations to African people for everything that we as white people and white women have done to African people, to African men, women, and children, and for the lifestyle that we have gained in an economy whose wealth and power are built on hundreds of years of stolen African freedom and labor. We have gained in an economy whose wealth and power are built on, on slaughter and terror. The African People's so Solid Socialist Party, the organization of the African working, working class is leading the struggle to liberate Africa and African people for reparations to Africa. And, and we are struggling for reparations to African people. And we say, that it is in our truest interest as white people, as white women, to jump off this pedestal, turn loose our whiteness, end our voluntary separation from the rest of the world, take responsibility for what we have done, and pay reparations to African people. This is, gives us an opportunity to be part of the future that the African liberation movement is bringing a world without the oppressors and without the oppressed, a world in which all human beings can live in peace, no one at the expense of anyone else. Join the Uhuru Solidarity Movement and the African People's Solidarity Committee. You can go to uhurusolidarity.org 